All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. You guys are in for a treat today. Okay. So, um, just a, a couple of quick things before we get started, um, letting everybody come in for a couple minutes. Um, the uh, exams, you know, you, you guys had your exam on Tuesday. I have not looked at them yet. Um, <laughs> problem three and four made me feel like your fish didn't, if it didn't have gills. So you're, you're suffocating and feeling, uh, that, that's, that's a clever way to phrase that. That, thank you for saying that. Um, <laughs> um, I will say that I think you're not alone there. I, I know that problem three in particular was rather in depth. Problem four, I understand was, it felt like uncharted territory and I apologize. I will be sympathetic in my grading on that. However, I will say that problem four was actually rather straightforward if you were to take a look at the units. Um, and so I, you know, perhaps that was too challenging and I, you know, we'll, we'll see how the grading comes out, but I suspect I'll be giving a lot of partial credit for problem four and problem three was uh, involved and so I'll, I'll grade based on how how much I, I see that you understand about how to approach that type of problem um, but rest assured that you're not alone in feeling like that was overly difficult especially problems three and four yeah problem three was very long um, and so I'll as always I will grade accordingly my my goal is to grade based on how much you've learned not on how well you're performing on an exam. So I, I do my best um, and uh, and I do apologize that problem three was um, probably too long. I, I don't think I can get to grading those before the next class or two. I think it'll take me a bit of time because I've been handling lots and lots of obligations and behind on some things. So I, I think it'll be a more than a week before I get those back to you, but we will go over them um, and I'll I'll get the, them back to you uh, before too long. Okay, so today, um, unless there are any other pressing questions or issues about the exam, you need to vent some more, uh, feel free. But today we're going to go through kind of a, a fun, well, fun in a way. It's an interesting topic I think an engaging topic and in that manner fun to learn about, um, but it really is um, kind of a, a sad topic as well. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, so the Flint water crises, I say crises, um, not just one crisis. I, I guess people will call it the, the Flint water crisis, but really there was um, two or even three, depending on how you look at it, separate crises all related to what happened with um, the city of Flint and their management of their, their water treatment. Um, today, I also plan to have a guest appearance of my lovely wife. Um, she, yeah, as you'll see, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but she worked at the uh, Michigan Department of Health for a little while during this time, so got a very up close and personal perspective on some of the matters. Fortunately, she was a fellow and not an employee, and so um, that limited her ability to help, but it also uh, limited her liability for stuff that went on. And at one point, she was contacted when, while we were after we moved to Louisiana about. Um, they're trying to get her to testify about stuff and since we're in a different state and she wasn't really involved it, they eventually just stopped bothering. Um, but it's a, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, you probably have heard about it with relevance to the lead, which is kind of the, the primary, um, primary concern in a lot of ways and 
really have the most to do with the, um, the failure of the drinking water system, but there was a related Legionnaires outbreak. Um, there was quite a lot of um, bacteria in the water with boil water advisories and disinfection byproduct um, incidents where there, there was too much of those or um, uh, detectable over the, the limits. And with all of that, there were also health impacts in terms of people not wanting to simply shower. Um, there was actually an ep kind of an epidemic of r skin rashes because people were um, so scared of the water and then they thought that the water was causing the rashes. And so there was quite an uproar and um, a lot of issues involved outside of just the lead. So um, I, I got married in 2014 and my wife had just got this fellowship just after graduate school. It was a two year program. And so we ended up moving there and staying in Michigan for two years, really in, from 2014 to 2016, which was exactly the time where all of this was happening. So um, with that, I wanna go ahead and get into it. Um, and what I'm gonna do is kind of walk you through a timeline. Let me uh, move this out of the way. So I'm going to walk through kind of a, a timeline here and um, just really describe uh, the sequence of events um, in the form of a timeline so you can um, kind of see what happened. Hopefully, you know, if you have any questions along the way, um, but it, I'd, I'd like to present it this way because it's kind of a bit of a journey that um, Michigan went through, I guess you could say, uh, and Flint in particular. Okay, so what I will say is really where it all started was the day we put lead pipes into, into the water systems. Now, lead has been commonly used for plumbing and, and pipe systems for a very long time. In fact, the reason we have the abbreviation for lead as PB is the same reason that plumbers are called plumbers. So the P and the B, there's a Latin root here where all the plumbing in Roman times was done, or at least the fitting of pipes together. Um, a lot of that was done with lead because it's malleable, it's easy to form, to solder, to uh, manipulate. And so it was very commonly used uh, even in the Roman times. And there's some, some suggestion that that may have played part of the, the role in the downfall of the Roman Empire people getting lead poisoning over time and that not being uh, a very good thing for running a country. So lead has been around for a very long time. We used to put it in our pipes quite often, even back to the 1900s, and we never really kept track of exactly where all the lead pipes were being put. You know, nowadays we, we have blueprints, hopefully of anywhere we're digging and putting, installing uh, pipes and all that. But you can imagine 100 plus years ago, we weren't necessarily doing that. And the, you know, the records from 50, 60, 80, 100 years ago, you can imagine a lot of homes, if they're built on, you know, maybe renovations, we're not really sure where the pipes are. So it's quite a challenge uh, to replace them. So the, the lead in the drinking water for Flint really was coming from the pipes themselves, not from the water supply. Now, we'll, we'll talk about it more, but essentially the lead in the pipes is not always a problem if we're managing the, the water correctly. If we're allowing it to be corrosive, then we have a big problem because it's corroding the lead off of the pipes and into the water. Okay, in the 1930s to the 1960s, this is the next kind of piece of the story here for Flint. Um, and, you know, one thing I normally do, and I've, I think I uh, can't remember if I've uh, put a slide up. So let me, let me just pull up a um, Google Maps for you just to kind of show Flint, Michigan. Normally I, I try to do this as part of part of our presentation here. So Flint is about a little over an hour northeast of Lansing. Um, I was living in Lansing 
and that's the state capital. Um, I worked at the Department of Environmental Quality in downtown Lansing, and then eventually um, did a postdoc in, at MSU, which is East Lansing. Um, Detroit is over here, uh, again, about an hour, hour and a half away from Flint, um, Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids. Um, so that's, that's where we're talking about here. Um, and we'll come back to this uh, on occasion uh, to highlight different spots where um, where we're talking about. So in the in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even to the 60s, uh, Flint was part of the big auto industry boom. So there were several manufacturing plants in the area. Um, I think Flint had uh, perhaps Pontiac and maybe some others that uh, developed in that area and really brought a lot of economic development. There was lots of uh, people with jobs and with um, yeah, a lot of just a lot of industry there drawing um, drawing people and prosperity. And so one of the reasons, by the way, for that, if we go back to our map for a moment, was the easy access to port um, port cities and shipping. So the steel steel industry had easy access to ship uh, really across quite a bit of um, the country just by the proximity to the Great Lakes. So, of course, that could not last forever. And in the 1960s, uh, for uh, you know whatever the reasons, maybe it, we could have prevented this a little better, who knows, um, but the auto industry collapsed and we are familiar with the term the Rust Belt. Um, all that industry heavy area, lots of steel uh, processing, lots of steel um, manufacturing, car manufacturing really hit hit a low and that industry basically collapsed and Flint in particular was hit very, very hard by that. And that essentially brought about economic depression. So that, um, that economic situation uh, really, really is difficult, right? Anytime you have an economically depressed area for whatever the reason, you're going to have people suffering quite a bit more so than people that are, uh, you know, in a city that's prosperous. There's going to be challenges keeping the, the infrastructure going. Um, there's going to be, you know, lots of destitute people. And it's just a, a difficult time. So that's kind of the, the backdrop of Flint, which leads us to kind of the, the early 2000s, where um, Michigan had been doing a program that where essentially there was revenue sharing between cities. So if Grand Rapids was doing well, but Flint was not, then they would take some of the tax dollars that were generated in Grand Rapids and then say, okay, well, we're going to take some of this and allocate it to Flint and maybe some other cities. Um, and essentially distribute across the state to help um, help support cities that were struggling. Now, especially in light of the um, the industry collapse that was felt, that to me that that sounds like it makes a lot of sense to do the revenue sharing. At the same time, it's not really fair. So there's a in, in my simple opinion, with you know no real knack for the politics or the economics or whatever. It, I can see and sympathize with arguments on both sides of this, right? There's, they, they decided to stop it um, because it's not fair to those that you're taking from, um, but that really hurts the people that were receiving it, right? Um, if they were dependent on that, you know, if you didn't uh, phase it out appropriately, that's, that's really a big challenge. So complicated issue. I'm not here to say whether it was right or wrong, but that's what they did. And I, you know, I can see why it was there and why they would stop it. Given that, um, Flint really, really struggled. And just some context here, Flint by, by this time really has, has about half the population living there that it did back in the 1960s. So when the auto industry was booming, they had a, a healthy, large population. 
And then by the time the 2000s were rolling around, the population was um, so sparse because people would move away if they could afford to. There were not nearly as many jobs that had been supported by these industries. And um, their, their population was essentially half. And that might not sound too bad, um, but if you think about it, a city built based on, you know, let's say 1 million people or something is expecting to have the tax revenue of 1 million people where most of them are working. Now you give it a situation um, with all that infrastructure in place where now there's not nearly as many people working and not nearly as many people there in the first place, but the same amount of infrastructure to manage and, and take care of, you can start getting a sense for why that was such a, you know, why that can be such a big problem. Now, you know, you may also think to yourself, well, it's, it's kind of a problem that we would structure a city that way where it has to do, you know, has to maintain its population or do better in order to thrive. And I think you'd be right to make that observation. So at any rate, in 2011, the state begins appointing emergency managers for places like Flint um, who are having trouble meeting their um, meeting their required financial um, obligations. So uh, Flint, now that there was no revenue sharing, was beginning to default on some of their obligations, like paying, uh, keeping the utilities going or whatever it might be. Maybe they had taken loans for infrastructure uh, projects and they're getting to the point where they're going bankrupt. And so the state decides, well, we can't have this. Uh, we need to do something. And essentially the governor um, or the governors, I can't remember if there was a, a transition here, but they were appointing emergency managers who were not from Flint, who were not, um, not very in tune with what the Flint residents need or want. And who knows what, you know, what qualifications they had in the first place. Presumably they, maybe they had experience managing difficult budgets or something. I, you know, we could go look it up, but they, they weren't particularly, you know, it, it was a, an appointee position. Making decisions for Flint on their behalf in an effort to save them from going bankrupt. Now this becomes a real problem as we'll see because those emergency managers, first of all, they're rotating in different person every year. So somebody's appointed one year, um, I guess maybe they drop their current job and start doing that. And then a new one, maybe the same, maybe somebody different appointed the next year, all fairly arbitrary. And they're not necessarily qualified uh, to be this kind of mayor dictator sort of a role, um, even though that's kind of what they're doing. So. Again, it, it makes a little bit of sense why they would be appointed, but it, as you'll see, it, it had disastrous consequences. So in 2013, the emergency manager for Flint decided to switch to um, a new water source away from the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. Um, and I think that name may have changed at some point. I think the current name is Detroit Water and Sewerage. But essentially, Flint had been purchasing their water from, from Detroit, and essentially Detroit was piping it um, from their treatment. They would take from, uh, I think, Lake St. Clair or kind of right along here. I think that's where they were, the Detroit was receiving their water. And then they would treat it um, kind of a, a, a basic treatment, send it up the pipes, and then Flint had a small uh, drinking water plant um, in Flint to uh, kind of polish the water and send it along, um, you know, probably re-up the disinfection dose and send it along. So Flint had a water treatment plant, but it was designed essentially to maintain what um, Detroit had already been sending. So when the emergency manager decides to do this, essentially what he was looking for is some cost savings by 
building a new um, a new pipe, a new water supply, taking from Lake Huron here. And it would be kind of taking it next to Bay City and Saginaw and running a pipe down there. And that way they wouldn't have to pay Detroit every year um, for their water. So their thought was to save, I think it was $5 million over something like three or four years. We'll say three years. So, and this might be a, a yearly savings of, uh, of a bit of money. So perhaps that was a good long-term goal. Now, we get into a little bit of trouble here when Detroit hears about this. They kind of get angry, um, or so so I hear. And their, you know, their customer has not been, um, you know, is essentially planning to break the contract, I suppose. And I don't know the details of what the contract was, but at this point, Detroit says, okay, well, if that's the way you're going to be, you have one year, um, one year left of service, and this is, I think, kind of maybe April 2013, um, then we're terminating your service. So Detroit starts planning their, um, their distribution system updates, because that's actually quite a, a hefty infrastructure change. You know, you've got to excavate the water mains, close off the right valves, actually do an engineering project to uh, to make this change, that's a lot of water that flows. So you can't just, um, you know, turn a valve and you're done. This is a bigger project than that that's going to require an analysis of where the water is going, um, how much is going where, all of that. So that, I think, was a, a bit unexpected, at least for the emergency manager. And again, maybe if the emergency manager had, had more perspective here, um, and had some foresight to negotiate with Detroit, um, perhaps that could have been a better situation. And you, maybe you can, um, you could blame Detroit for this, uh, the, the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. You could place some blame on them if you wanted to in terms of, hey, why, why would you terminate their contract before they were ready? Um, but, you know, one year maybe is enough and you'll see in a few minutes, it, it seems that they kind of redeemed themselves uh, to an extent when they, when they saw Flint uh, was really suffering. Okay, so same year, 2013, uh, Flint realizes that their planned renovations, this um, new water, water system coming from um, Lake Huron is not going to finish in time. And so, they, they're essentially in a bind now. They've committed to a plan um, and Detroit Water and Sewerage says, okay, while well, you're committed to that, you've got one year, one year notice and then you're gone. Um, we wanted you as customers, but if, if you're just going to um, run away without telling us or something, then you know, this is what it's going to be. So given that, Flint decides um, that by April 2014, they're going to switch to the Flint River for water supply. Now, there's something here that's the, really the biggest issue is that fl the Flint River is more corrosive and the Flint water treatment plant, when they were doing the updates to, to handle this, they failed to add corrosion control. That was a really terrible failure. So. In terms of engineering failure, that's probably the biggest one here. If they had um, added a, a unit step, a unit process to add corrosion control, which is orthophosphate, just basically PO4, 3 minus, or some version of phosphate. Um, it's like we put this stuff in our, you know, we, we put H3PO4 in our soda to to get it to be a little bit acidic, to help the carbonation. This is common stuff. You don't need a lot of it. You just need a little bit to take the corrosive edge off of the off of the um, the water, and so that it, it no longer will essentially rust or corrode your pipes. So 
in our distribution systems, what we always want is for mineral deposits to form. We actually want our pipes to grow mineral deposits, which, you know, in some sense that might sound yucky or gross or something to have minerals depositing and the pipe starts shrinking down because there's not, you know, there's so many mineral deposits. But we actually want that to happen slowly. Um, in the reason we want that to happen is because the alternative is it'll be corrosive and you'll do, you'll be deleting or um, the pipe will be uh, deteriorating over time and it will eventually start leaking. Okay, so did they skip that step um, to implement it faster? You know, I think it was just gross negligence. Um, and I think there's some charges now about it. Um, I, I don't know um, if it was, hey, let's do it faster, let's, let's skip that. Um, from what I heard, it was just simply they they forgot to check it or something. So the part of the thing was the water that Detroit was sending was always um, already had the corrosion control or was non-corrosive. Um, I think it, I think Detroit was supplying, excuse me, the, the corrosion control, adding the orthophosphate and whatever else. Um, and so by the time it came to Flint, they didn't really have to worry about it. So this lack of corrosion control, as we'll see, started stripping the minerals off of these pipes. And generally that's bad, but it's especially so when you have lead pipes. Because if, you're, if you've got minerals depositing on top of a lead pipe, you don't have to worry about the lead. There's not really a problem. It's never going to come out into the water if instead of corroding it, you are essentially adding more minerals on top of it. So normally, if you're operating your, treat, your treatment process properly, the lead pipe pipes are not even a problem. Um, obviously, we see in Flint, this was a um, gigantic issue. Okay, so that's when we really, um, how, I guess the, the time point that we would define where the Flint water crisis started. Now, just a, a little bit of perspective here. In April of 2014, I am writing my PhD dissertation, preparing to defend. Um, I just got engaged a few months back and um, my fiance is applying to this, this fellowship and trying to decide where to go. And, you know, I was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing next. And I'm graduating in August, you're graduating in May. Uh, go for it, sign up for it. And so that's where I was in life. And I was in Georgia um, at Georgia Tech. My wife was doing a master's in public health at Emory. We actually met at a wastewater treatment plant, um, funny enough. You can ask, ask her about that in a few minutes. She's gonna come in um, towards the end of class when we talk about the, the Legionnaire's disease outbreak. Okay, so April, 2014. Um, as soon as the switch is made, residents start complaining immediately about the water quality. Now, if you remember back to when we started talking about drinking water in general, um, one of the things I noted was the difference between aesthetic and health related concerns. And I told you that the aesthetic was non, um, non enforceable. So when they start complaining, this is what's going through um, the minds of the operators and the government officials and things. And I'm just going to be charitable to them. Okay. This is the charitable explanation of why they would tell the Flint residents that it's okay. What they would be doing is checking the water quality as it comes out of the treatment plant. Um, there are also a couple of tests that happen out in the distribution system at various taps. I'll come back to that and talk about it a little bit. That rule has actually been updated in light of the Flint uh, crisis, but essentially there, there was um, some random sampling at different taps. So when the, the, the residents start complaining, the officials would be looking at their data and saying, well, it's coming out of the treatment plant as safe to drink. It's different water, you know, things happen 
the, the water's going to taste a little different. It's going to maybe smell a little different. It, maybe it has a slight color or something uh, when you, whenever you do a big update like this. Well, in that regard, the officials were not yet wrong in, in saying that, as far as they know, the water should be safe to drink. Um, now, obviously it wasn't, and that's a massive problem, but the charitable explanation is that it was safe coming out of the treatment plant, which was true. Um, and then these aesthetic standards that the, you know, it, it's tricky because the, the lay person is going to see the difference, feel the difference, and assume that there's something really bad here. And in this case, they actually were assuming correct. But if none of the pipe pipes were lead, maybe it would have been okay, at least for a time, even though it was tasting bad and smelling bad and all of that. So it, it, it is kind of a tricky situation there. So in August 2014, um, I was still in Atlanta at this point, just um, graduating and preparing to move to Michigan. And at this point in Michigan, it's their hottest summer of the year. It probably feels a little bit like it does outside here today in Louisiana. Um, essentially, they, um, the river, the Flint River, had more bacteria because the water's warm, there's maybe lots of rain, and they get into a situation where their, their disinfection process is not operating well enough to handle the additional um, fecal coliforms and just general bacteria. So they, as they're doing their monitoring, they notice that they have too many bacteria coming out of their disinfection chamber um, and sending down downstream. And so what they do is they, they issue a boil water advisory and they end up having to do this twice. And their solution on the treatment end is just to add more chlorine. Now, there's an issue here as well that not only did the, the Flint water treatment plant not have corrosion control, it also turns out that when they were doing this, the renovations or revisions to use the Flint River water, they did not um, engineer it properly. And what I mean by that is it was already there. The treatment plant for the most part was there. They were doing some updates. Um, the disinfection contactor was not big enough to provide an adequate contact time with low chlorine concentrations. You see, you can disinfect something really quickly with a really high concentration of chlorine. That's what we learned with the CT concept um, and with the Chick Watson kinetics and all that. But that's not ideal if you're you're going to also um, have organic matter in the water because you're going to form lots of these disinfection byproducts that are potentially carcinogenic or um, toxic and just something that we don't want to drink, right? So that's where our trihalomethanes, that disinfection byproduct, um, Flint, um, by adding so much chlorine, they ended up getting dinged on tri trihalomethane. So these, these disinfection byproducts were found. And so the, that's basically telling them, hey, you're you are over chlorinating, you need to stop, you need to, to reduce your chlorine dose. And so they're, they're battling between um, not having enough disinfection and having too much chlorination. And so you can see that like this treatment plant really is not, um, not up to snuff for this demand during, um, during that month. So within that, that one month, they are sending unsafe water down the pipes that they know from the treatment plant. But that's actually the only month where they knew that they were sending it out from the treatment plant and it's, it was unsafe coming out of the treatment plant. So with that, the, the boil water advisory, um, people know it's bad. Uh, they, they were complaining immediately. And now that they're saying, okay, you have to boil your water, okay, we're good. Oh, we you have to boil your water again. And then this thing, it was just bad news for them. During that same month, the city officials 
had the, the audacity to say to their residents, the water is safe. Now, granted, when it was not, when you were not getting the, the boil water advisory or the high tri methanes, presumably it was safe when those two conditions were not happening. But they had the, you know, it, it's amazing how hypocritical they are here because they, they were the city officials in the city office, in the city building, were ordering bottled water to deliver to the city office while at the same time telling the city to drink the water, it's fine, stop complaining. So that is just mind blowing the, um, that uh, hypocrisy there. And that was also in August, 2014. So by December, 2014, Flint had already spent $4 million on water treatment plant upgrades. So they are working to upgrade it and realizing along the way that it's inadequate. Um, so if you think about their original goal over a few years, save 5 million bucks um, with this project, they're not even getting traction towards that new water supply because they had to do something in between. Um, sure, maybe you can blame Detroit for that, but I, I would think that the emergency manager at least has part is partly to blame for not negotiating properly with, with Detroit. Um, maybe they're not honoring a contract, who knows? So regardless, that's they're already pretty much in the hole or about to be, and it hasn't been more than a year um, working towards that. So it's pretty shocking how, how badly this is going for them. Now, by the way, um, in October, That's when I moved up there. Um, my wife was already there. We got married in October and I moved up at that point. Um, so this is where I arrived on the scene. And that's, that's kind of where I, I picked up there. Okay, so did they ever replace the lead pipes? They've been working on that for quite some time um, since this, uh, since this all came about. And what you'll see is it turns out they don't have to replace the pipes, but everybody wants you to because this was such a problem, right? You, you don't actually need new pipes if you switch back to um, proper corrosion control and ensure that you always have proper co corrosion control, which is true of many cities. Um, many locations have leaded pipes and it's it's not ideal, but it's um, it, it's a situation that can easily be controlled with um, those protective measures. So in Flint, they have been going through. It was actually difficult to find all of the pipes and to identify which homes had leaded pipes. I think that at some point there was some computer algorithms being developed to to do just that um, with, with some reasonable success too. So that, that, that has been happening. And I think recently there was um, some uh, bit of news that it, what they had completely um, handled it and, and ran it, was basically uh, fully replaced all, all the leaded pipes or, or nearly so. Okay, so uh, next page of the timeline here. In January, 2015, um, Detroit Water and Sewerage sees that Detroit, uh, that Flint is hurting and is not doing very well. And so they offer to go ahead and reconnect Flint. You know, this is less than a year since they, they changed, you know, it was April when they, they made the change. And they say, hey, we see that this is not going so well for you. Um, why don't you go ahead and reconnect to us? We will, you know, put you back on your contract and we're even going to waive the reconnection fee. Now, that's really important because this reconnection fee is not trivial. I mentioned earlier, this is a, a large engineering project. You're going to have to rent equipment, um, excavators or you know, whatever, probably install new pipes or um, new fittings, and I mean, large ones at that. 
uh, you're going to have to draft engineering drawings, of, um, set up the project to uh, to to manage this project as a you know, engineering implementation, and it's simply just an expensive endeavor. It's at least uh, I would expect at least tens of thousands of dollars um, going to that reconnection process. So when they when they offer this, and, and maybe it's even in the hundreds, I don't know. When they offer to reconnect and waive the fee, they're really actually extending quite quite a nice offer, um, uh, quite generous in, in a lot of sense. So, you know, perhaps Detroit did something wrong, the, the Detroit Water and Sewerage, uh, perhaps they were uh, too quick to pull the plug, but at least they are kind of offering, offering help when it became clear that Flint was um, not doing well there. Now, of course, the, uh, the brilliant emergency manager at the time uh, decides that they still don't want Detroit Water and Sewerage Department's help. Um, they still want to do it their own. And there's a, um, a, a psychological term for this, right? It's like propagation of error. It's like you, you made a bad choice, you're going in a bad direction, but since you're already kind of committed, you want to keep going with it. It's like, you know, when you're, if you're gambling or something and you're, you're losing, well, but maybe if I keep going, I'll do better or something. You know, it's, there's a uh, psychological term. And I, I think that's very fitting here and a very, um, very unwise decision by this emergency manager. Um, and, and honestly, that's, that's a lot of blame, I think, that would go uh, straight to this person for, for that particular decision. Especially because just a couple months later, in March of 2015, the city council of Flint voted unanimously to reconnect to Detroit, because Detroit had this offer, the standing offer to them, like, hey, look, we, we see that this is not good. We like you as a customer. Why not just sign up? We're, we'll, we'll waive the fee. Um, you know, sorry we canceled you. Let's let's just you know take care of your people here. Um, of course, the city council, the ones that actually know the will of the people, um, the best representation of the locals. Uh, of course, their their vote doesn't matter. They they don't matter. Only the the emergency manager appointed by the the state matters, right? So they get vetoed by the emergency manager who says no. We're not doing that. Um, so really, this this guy has uh, got some poor decision making skills here. So sometime in the next few months, kind of mid two thousand fifteen. Um, by the way, I started working at the Department of Environmental Quality, Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, right around February here, um, and that was a. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say not. Um, I, I ended up working for the Department of Environmental Quality. Fortunately, I, I was kind of wanting to do a, um, a drinking water type of a job because that was sort of my expertise. But fortunately, I got a wastewater permitting job. Um, so I was a entry level wastewater permitter, uh, permit writer. And uh, I started work around there and that kind of shielded me from all the drinking water stuff that was happening. Okay, that, that is a good question. Was there an actual explanation by the EM other than ego? I, I don't know. Um, I haven't heard of anything. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the lesson for today. Is bureaucracy is amazing. Um, you know, I, I'm actually pretty curious. That's a very good question. I'll try to take a look at that and um, get a better answer for you next time, because maybe they were looking at the financials and still thought it was going to be a good deal. And, and therefore, they felt like their obligation was to um, just go based on the financials. And, you know, again, if I wanted to be really charitable, which I'm, I was not being particularly charitable, <laughs> in part because it, in some ways, it just really feels like they don't deserve it. <laughs> but if I was to be um, charitable here, they're probably looking at the, the data and um, the, the water treatment plant officials, you know, engineers, scientists who are saying, yes, the water discharging out of our system is 
clean and safe to drink. Um, yes, we understand there's going to be some aesthetic uh, issues with it. We regret that, but there's not, not really anything to do about it. So aside from the engineers or you know whoever was in, in charge of checking to make sure that they had corrosion control, aside from that monumental failure, given that things looked to be okay um, and so perhaps it still looked like a reasonable decision to try to save the money and do what they were doing. Um, you know, by mid-2015, there was uh, elevated lead levels discovered in children's blood. And so it took a um, pediatrician who noticed this, noticed that Flint resident children were were having really high levels of lead in their blood. Um, it, it's really incredible that it took that to discover the problem. And so that pediatrician contacted um, a professor who had worked with this type of thing. I think she was trying to contact a lot of different people, actually. I think she was in touch with the EPA. And this guy, Mark Edwards from um, Virginia Tech, he worked on a similar issue in Washington, D.C. back in uh, the early 2000s. And so he had, he's had some experience there, had some um, some papers and uh, uh, some work in that arena. And um, eventually he, he comes over and essentially conducts a study to, to find like what was what was going on with the water distribution system, because that's what the pediatrician was um, suspecting because at that point, you know, we did not have data to show that there was lead in the water. Um, we should have the, uh, our lead in water rule for, for checking different taps and the, the randomization, um, and the statistical analysis of whether or not, you know, there is an outlier. So when, when you go and check somebody's random tap, you don't know if this is some, um, you know, unused warehouse that's been sitting with lead pipes and with no running water for many years, and then you turn it on once every five years to check it. You know, in that case, maybe there's a case to be made to say, well, you have to flush that better or count that one as an error. So the, the lead and water rule did have some caveats like that that were in play and have since been questioned pretty strongly, and there's a revised lead and copper rule now. Um, to clear that up but there, so there was some controversy there there may have been some um malpractice there i don't know that it was purposeful um at the state level in terms of monitoring that um, but it's again it's just awful that it had to be found in children before we knew about it in the water so really a a, a historic disaster um in terms of uh, in terms of our field the water treatment so uh, by October 2015, um, with all of this and with all the pressure there, Flint finally switches back to Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. And this is the best thing they could have done and they should have done it, you know, 10 months earlier. Um, so this brings back the corrosion control, uh, which, you know, once the pipes are flushed through with the non-corrosive, in fact, the uh, anti-corrosive water for, for some amount of time, that really is effectively going to fix the lead side of the Flint water crisis. So, you know, there's a question earlier, did they, have they ever replaced all the pipes? And they have been replacing pipes, but as soon as this happened, there really was not nearly as much of a need for that. Um, and that, in some sense, that replacing the pipes may be more of like a psychological, hey, we're here with you, we're not going to let this happen again type of a, type of a feel. So in January 2016, so kind of after a lot of this is starting to die down, the governor of Michigan admits that there was a Legionnaire's disease outbreak. Now, um, in a few minutes, we'll talk more about that, but this was ongoing during this process as well. Uh, Legionnaire's disease is essentially a bacteria that causes pneumonia. Um, Legionella, Legionella is the bacteria it causes legionellosis, which is the same thing as Pontiac fever, 
um, for um, yeah, Legionnaire's disease. And essentially, it's a it's, it's ad pneumonia um, that is typically transmitted based on some some water, like in a in a shower. If the, the water system is contaminated, um, you have to kind of breathe in water droplets that have this bacteria to get pneumonia from it. So it, it was a serious deal. Um, we'll talk more about it in a few minutes. But the, the crazy thing is it took them that long to even admit it, even though we knew about it in 2014 and 2015 in the summers. In February of 2017, the CDC linked the Flint water to that Legionnaire's outbreak. Uh, turns out there's also a hospital that also became culprit. So the theory is that there is this hospital, McLaren Hospital, had been, had been um, dealing with this, uh, with, with the Legionnaires problem in their water, um, their centralized water system. So, or I guess decentralized. There, a lot of hospitals manage their own water in some sense. They'll take the, the water from the treatment plant and then um, put in a, a few more controls to make sure that the water is the best quality for, for their needs. And they also have to kind of take special care for their wastewater because they've got lots of pharmaceuticals and things. So um, that particular hospital had been having issues with their water system, had been alerted of it, and had not um, properly cleaned it out and uh, managed it. So once the Flint water um, was switched to the Flint River, that hospital encountered different water conditions that made it worse, perhaps adding more Legionnaires disease, excuse me, Legionella bacteria. Um, and we ended up with another epidemic on top of the Flint water crisis in terms of the lead, the lead crisis. So um, every time I, I give this, I, I go ahead and I check the timeline on Wikipedia to see what, what happens or you know, what's the latest news. And um, the, the latest as of January, 2021, this year, um, the former governor, uh, Rick Snyder, and eight um, other government officials have been charged with a total of 34 felonies, two misdemeanors, and uh, two officials have been charged with involuntary manslaughter, um, which, you know, in some sense, it's very, it, it's very gratifying to the the side of you that wants to see justice for failure and for um, negligence, right? Now, I don't know who's receiving all of those, um, you know, and I don't know to what extent, you know, a governor, for example, is making relevant decisions, but certainly appointing emergency managers and not, um, not giving them the proper oversight, uh, certainly culpable there. So I am suspecting that some of these are emergency managers that are getting charged. Um, the, the people that were uh, fail, whoever it was that failed to notice the corrosion control issue. Yeah, <laughs> attempted murder. Um, maybe so, I don't know. Um, like I said, there is a potential charitable explanation you could, you could uh, look at um, it, if, if they believed, and it's reasonable to think that they could have believed that the water was safe before knowing about the the lead in lead finding in children. So that, there is something important here to kind of a, to look at, right? As we learn through a process like the COVID pandemic or something, we're going to learn and gather more information as we go. And decisions made yesterday are going to look really silly sometimes, and the way that the information is propagated through our news outlets and stuff is often not very helpful. Um, it, it can very easily conflate things. You know, the, the news really is driven by what's going to be profitable, what are people going to click on. So, you know, in this case, it wasn't too big of a deal. No one was hearing much about it until, you know, middle 2015, then we see this lead in children's blood then it blows up and that's you know it, it's convoluted it's difficult it's not ideal um we'll see what which of these charges stick so right now they're being charged i don't think that means they they have uh 
been, um, what's the legal word? I, I don't think they've been convicted yet. Um, but it's good to see that there are serious charges um, being laid against the, um, the appropriate parties. Um, at least I hope, hope that it's the appropriate party. So yeah, it, as, as somebody said, um, the bureaucracy is incredible. Okay, so um, come on in. Hello. Hi. So everyone, this is my wife, Lily. Um, so we're about to start talking about the, um, so you can see them typing here and then I'll kind of pop up there as well. Um, so we're, we're about to get to the, yeah, everybody, you better say hi to my wife because she, she's a, she determines extra credit, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> OMG, hello. <laughs> okay. So, um, we'll, we'll be getting to the, um, to the uh, Legionnaires' disease here in just a moment. Um, yeah, and they just had a heart exam, so they're all, uh, oh. they're going to be begging, begging you. Know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, just to sum, sum up the, uh, the operational issues with the, um, the water control side of things. I said it a million times already, corrosion control, really the lack thereof was the biggest issue. We had inadequate treatment comp capacity at the Flint plant. Um, they had an adequate treatment for what they were receiving from Detroit, but not enough for Flint itself uh, to take from the Flint River water. So therefore they were excessively chlorinating. That extra chlorine was also contributing to the corrosiveness, but just generally the Flint River was, um, just happened to be kind of corrosive and they were not adding that uh, corrosion control. Another thing that I didn't mention yet was we, we talked about how the whole system, uh, the whole city of Flint was very economically depressed. A lot of people had moved away. So that meant there's, you know, if 50% of the population was gone, that means there are half of the homes are vacant and lots of empty lots. That has important implications for the um, age of the water. And we, in distribution talk, we, we talk about water age in terms of how long it has existed in the pipes since being sent from the treatment plant. That's super relevant when we want to consider how much chlorine is still there, um, how much potential is there for bacteria to be growing, like the Legionella bacteria. And so that's something that um, probably exacerbated the issue given the worst water quality coming from the Flint River and the issues there then it had a lot of time to sit in these these areas, these dead zones. If we think of our, our piping system kind of like a flood flow reactor, but sometimes it just stops. Um, that's just not, not at all ideal. So on that note, there's a, a couple of um, papers I've posted to Moodle. You'll see um, kind of a, a snapshot of one here um, by Mark Edwards. I've also posted his lecture. It's, it's very interesting to hear his perspective. There's more bureaucratic issues with the EPA and their involvement or lack thereof. Um, so he's, he's pretty feisty towards them. Um, and it, from, from his perspective, it sounds like rightly so. Um, and he, by the way, became very unpopular with a lot of, a lot of people for doing, doing this because it, um, it just was, uh, uncouth or, or kind of taboo to, to say the things he was saying at the time before people knew stuff. Um, so I want to show you real quick um, a few reading assignments I've posted. What I want, um, so we've got the uh, two readings and then the, this lecture if you want to hear kind of that different perspective. Um, these two papers here are, are linked. These are the two papers. What, I'm, what I want for you to do and you know, kind of check out these pipes, it's kind of crazy. Um, what I'm looking for you to do is read based on your interest and, you know, so read as much as you want based on your interest, but at least take a look and see kind of the, the major operational issues and kind of read the abstract, take a look through the introduction, take a look at the conclusions and go from there. Okay. So, um, that the Flint water crisis, I'll have a Moodle quiz on that. It's, 
like our other ones, it's not going to be too crazy involved, but there's some resources there for you to um, to look further. And I may I may have a question or two that kind of asks you to draw from those papers a little bit. So take a look. Um, should be interesting uh, following this. Okay, so from here, I have some slides on Legionella, um, which is why my lovely wife is here. So Legionella, and if you want to, like, feel free to jump in and try to or, or talk some, but I'm just going to carry on until I've got specific things. We, we haven't practiced this guy, so. Yeah. <laughs> I've I, I kept asking her um, over the past few years, like, hey, I'm doing this Flint Water Fest. Do you want to want to guest lecture? But now that we're at home, I was like, hey, let's, let's do it. So my, my coworker here. OK, so um, I mentioned a couple minutes ago, legionellosis is essentially a pneumonia. Um, it is uh, pretty severe pneumonia. Pneumonias can be, um, can be pretty harsh. Uh, you know, maybe if somebody that's young and healthy got it, maybe it wouldn't be so severe or... Um... It's actually called Pontiac fever. <clears throat> Pontiac fever for the Pontiac, Michigan, which is kind of interesting. Um, when younger folks get it, it usually is not, um, doesn't hit the uh, surveillance system because the symptoms are so mild that people just are like, oh, I have a cold, and then they go home and rest up, have some chicken noodle soup, and they're fine. Okay. Great. So, so for a lot of people, it's just a little cold, right? Um, now, the, the issue is, um, if you're elderly, then it becomes pretty severe, or oftentimes is. Now, you know, with the, with the COVID pandemic and everything, we're very familiar with um, precautions. And one interesting thing about this, I kind of mentioned it earlier, is it's actually not transmittable person to person that we that we know of. I mean, maybe in an extreme case, you could there's one very extreme case from Italy where there was no um, no circulation in the room. Husband and wife, uh, wife was taking care of husband and got the disease, but there was very little circulation in the house, no windows, very enclosed, small living space. So it is incredibly rare um, up until even, it was like a couple years ago that this study came out that uh, with person to person transmission. So typically it's just environmental. So, so in, environmental, as in like a, I think the legion, the legionnaires was like a, a group club sort of thing, and they had a, um, their shower water was contaminated, and when you're taking a shower and you've got all that aerosolized water, that was infected, and so they're breathing that in, and and a bunch of them got sick from that environmental factor. Um, okay, so how do we so, um, track diseases? Now, I, I think especially with um, the COVID pandemic, this hopefully will be interesting. So typically what happens for a disease that we call reportable, meaning we are, you know, our health practitioners are obligated to report this up the chain so that it goes to somebody like my wife to track for, um, you know, how many of these disease incidences do we have? The epidemiolo epidemiologists like to track them like we, we talked about with the ghost map. You can if you can identify where it's happening, then you can maybe know why it's happening. So somebody gets an exposure and they get sick. And so what do you do when you get sick? You go to the doctor, right? So you, you have, you, you're exposed, you get sick. So you go to your doctor or the, the hospital or whatever. From there, they typically will, you know, diagnose you, maybe give you uh, some, some tests and say, okay, well, let's send that sample off to the lab. I think you've got strep throat. And so they test it and yes or no, whatever it is, if it's COVID, then, you know, they, you know, they say, sorry, uh, you've got two, two days to live. No. Um, if it's something reportable, they'll send it to, you know, in our case, Louisiana disease surveillance system or, you know, wherever, whatever system you're involved in, um, maybe that sample ended up at the local health department, maybe it's at the laboratory, who communicates it to the others, but at the end of the day, it's going to be tracked into a, not a global, but a kind of a statewide database, and then maybe the CDC will get that from, from the states. They will. <laughs> and so that's the way we end up tracking it, is this hospital diagnosis, we get some sort of laboratory confirmation, and then it says, okay, this is a case, and this is the, the description of the person. Um, from there, a lot of times the, the local health department 
will be tasked with collecting more data from particular individuals. So with COVID, I'm not sure how much of it they've been doing, but with something like Legionnaires where it's reportable, meaning it's going to end up in a system like this, um, it's also pretty rare. So then what normally happens is the local health department ought to follow up with some surveys. Um, yeah, so it kind, of, it kind of depends on the rarity of the disease and also um, the number of the disease. So when I worked at the state health department in Michigan, I had um, three or four different diseases that I set up a flag to report to me if I had, say, more than three cases of Legionella in one uh, particular county in one week. Uh, like a seven day time period. So people, you can be either more lax or more uh, just strict with your definition, um, but you will usually set it up to where the system automatically reports to you. And then uh, it's like an isolated case, particularly because Legionella is spread through environmental um, factors, like you could get it gardening. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's in the dirt, if you uh, kick up a lot of dirt, you can get it that way. Um, it's it's not like an immediate emergency if like one case shows up somewhere but once you start getting two three four fifteen you're it's like on the local health department usually has jurisdiction to look into what's going on um, but the state department can also come in and help out if, if they're asked depending on the state depending on the rules for that state so i think in louisiana here we have a state jurisdiction, so we would be the ones look well, we I say I don't work for the state anymore, but the state officials would be the ones going to that local place and saying, OK, we see that there's some some big um, case numbers going on and they would look in and investigate that. Thank you. And, and so in Michigan, in this particular case uh, there, we ended up finding I say we, they ended up finding um, cases of Legionnaire's disease um, in and around Flint. And you know, with all of the, the issues with the Flint water supply and everything, there's a lot of questions about, hey, is this related? Um, is this actually linked to the water? Is it separate? What's going on here? And um, one of the big issues, again, about the bureaucracy and the, the politicking and the failures here um, the local health department was not really doing their job in terms of collecting the type of surveys they were supposed to, the right data, and they were not telling the laboratory or, or essentially going and taking or doing the sets themselves or whatever. They, they needed to track the DNA of the Legionella and they weren't doing it. Um, you were even had told them at some point that Oh, know. I begged to help because I actually, it was a requirement of the program I was doing at the time to get outbreak experience. So I was like, ooh, an outbreak. This is a cluster analysis. We should go in and look. And I sent several emails that probably ended up as evidence in a lawsuit <laughs> uh, to the local, I hope ended up as evidence to a lawsuit that ended up um, at the state, the local health department, because in Michigan, locals had the jurisdiction and we as the state were not allowed to go in and work on an outbreak unless the locals invited us. It's the same with CDC. CDC is not allowed to go to a state to work on an outbreak without the state inviting them um, because of state jurisdiction so and local jurisdiction in this case. So yeah, it was really frustrating to be not able to help and to see that they weren't collecting data because you know if you talk to a person right after they got sick, you can say, hey, what were you doing two weeks ago? If you talk to them a month, a month and a half, two months, like, I don't know what I was doing like three or four weeks ago. I mean, I can maybe reconstruct it because I keep a detailed calendar, but most people don't do that. <laughs> so it's hard. Even the hard. pandemic makes it a little easier. Okay, the pandemic makes it a little easier now, but. <laughs> so, so they essentially weren't collecting the data that you needed in order to link this outbreak to the river, the, the Flint River water. And that was a big issue. When I was taking you through the timeline, we did say that by 2017, the CDC finally had enough evidence to decide that they believed it was linked. Um, but there was a real, real big issue there. You know, I heard that that local health department for Genesee County used to be amazing. And then in recent years, it, the, the staff, the, the people there just really had a very terrible relationship, very, a lot of inadequacy and um, just 
bad, bad stuff going on and a terrible relationship with, um, with the, uh, the state department. Um, are there no such standards for collecting that data? So n there are, CDC has put out guidance as a national organization. All they really can provide is guidance. There are some standards, so case definitions for what qualifies as a confirmed probable or suspect case. Those are set by the CDC. Um, and there are like ideas, you know, people have surveys, there are some basic standards for data to collect, but there's no like, uh, there may be now, uh, but there wasn't at the time of here is how you should collect data um, for a Legionnaire's disease outbreak. Um, I, there, I think there is, it's usually guidelines and not standards um, when it comes to public health, because different with 50, 50 states, you'll have 50 different sets of rules to how you can collect data, what data you can collect from people. Um, so it's very hard to say there's like a standard. There, there are guidelines and things that are considered standards, but yeah, it's not, it's not like on the engineering side where it's like, oh no, things have to be met to these exact um, regulations. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So, um, if we want to take a look at some data, I mentioned earlier that there was um, kind of an ongoing thing. Eventually, we realized it was kind of an ongoing outbreak. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to your question in a moment. I'm gonna explain this slide, but I, I will come back to that question. Okay. Um, well, so the data from 2010 to 2013, those are just like so they get you know at most four cases in a month. Um, so this is a month by month case count. And that's kind of just background noise. You're always going to have some, like I was saying before, environmental Legionnaires disease happening. Um, it's just gonna happen. But when in uh, June of 2014, cases really started to spike, that was when um, you can clearly see that there's like something going on here. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a, is this right to call it an epi curve? Yes, this would be what you would call an epi curve. We usually make those for um for so, outbreaks. So when we're taking a look at the, the rate of a disease incidence over time, we take a look and we see that at some point the cases increase and then and then drop back down. And so it's pretty common for Legionella to be more prevalent during the summer. And this, you know, looking at this summer compared to some of the baseline ones, we really see that there's something going on here. And that lines up very well with the switch to the um, Flint water, uh, Flint river water happened right here. So that's um, a really suspect. And if we were to look at the, the data from the following year, which I don't have, I don't know. If you have um, there was there. another curve. There was another um, increase in cases. It did the same thing. Um, so both of those years, there was a, a Legionella outbreak and the governor admitted that like late 2016 or something like I showed you. And yeah, great stuff there. You know, two years late, they already knew what was happening and they just didn't want to admit it. <laughs> um, so the question about where, you know, where that water has come for, can we blame it? And I'll go, I'll go ahead and answer your question, Reese. Um, if Legionella bacteria is linked to the water, um, was the disinfection process not eliminating it at an adequate rate? It, this is an interesting question and an interesting case because Legionella, um, as we've said, is around in the environment. Now, we do a pretty good job keeping our pipes pressurized to have positive pressure to push out of the pipes to keep environmental stuff from getting in, but it's not foolproof. And at some point, people are digging ditches and installing pipes, and they're not doing that in a sterile manner, right? So there's going to be it's likely that there are bacteria around and very likely that almost every water system is going to have some number of Legionella in it um, if there's Legionella around. But it's partly a matter of making sure that there's enough residual disinfectant to prevent it from growing into big biofilms and propagating. And so when we have a particular case where water is handled in whatever special way the hospital does, and we have a lot of dead space in the distribution system in general, um, and we have the change in water quality that might trigger the bacteria to grow better. All of these factors 
putting together. And, and one of the papers, by the way, um, that I linked does delve into this a little bit more. Um, but all those types of parameters are things we suspect to be the reasons, not so much the at the drinking water treatment plant itself. So um, when trying to figure out whether or not we're blaming the, the river water for this outbreak, um, we can take a look at some data. And this, would, again, would be um, a job of an epidemiologist here to uh, take a look, gather this type of data from surveys and say, OK, well, uh, you person who who's got sick, um, were you, you know, are you a resident of the city of Flint or do you have a, where's your water source? Is it the city of Flint? Is it township? Is it a private well? What is it? And so we can see a breakdown here where 47% um, you know, of 45, so 21 of 45 um, were on the city of Flint water. So that's, you know, it looks like that might be contributing, but there's there are certainly more cases that did not have um, the city water there. So a little bit inconclusive, but maybe a suggestion. Um, so then they, they looked at some other parameters. I think it's pretty typical to ask about healthcare exposure for things like this. And so 27 of this 45 had some sort of healthcare exposure recently. Um, and that kind of tips you off, well, okay, maybe there's an issue with the hospital. Um, so even though this set of data is not particularly conclusive, it's, it's certainly interesting in it kind of showing you, okay, well, maybe, you know, it, it could be that these 10 that don't know, maybe those are all city of Flint. We just, we don't know. And that kind of goes to, to show the difficulty of collecting this type of data. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons we don't have the standards in place is because it, it just gets tricky sometimes when you have to ask people, hey, uh, what's your water supply? I mean, can you guys tell me what, what, uh, what water system you're, you're getting your water from? Um, you know, I, Think about that. You know, do do you know? <laughs> uh, or where do your parents get their water from? Because everybody, I would assume most of y'all have East Baton Rouge water, unless you're living elsewhere. Yeah. So depending on where you are, you know, you, you may or may not know that, and you can imagine the you know random citizens around. You you guys are at least in a water treatment class, or or tuning in because you know me or something, and you're interested. Um, so. You know, it, it's an interesting question, like where, where is our water coming from and how many people are going to know that? Okay, so then the, the alternate hypothesis that ended up uh, bearing out to be fairly true or, or determined to be um, the case is this Hospital A, which somebody was not allowed to say even the name. Oh, right? yes. We, we removed all names of all hospitals in the report. It was Hospital A. Um. <laughs> so Hospital A, a.k.a. McClare and McClare and Hospital. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you spell it, but um, I'll write it up there in big bold letters because they are, have been found to be at fault. Um, and they they're still denying it. Like now, I just saw an article from earlier this year where they're still denying accusations. So it's very frustrating. They're very. I was informed by my boss that oh, you may not say McClare and Hospital is responsible. Um, because they are very politically powerful in this state. They were a huge hospital system. They had multiple hospitals in multiple cities. And so I said, well, it looks like it's McLaren Hospital. So, you know, innocent person that I am. I'm just looking at the data. And uh, <laughs> my boss said, no, 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 no. Do not say that. Do not say that. We are not allowed to say that. We have to keep good ties with the, with the hospital. So it was a very interesting look into uh the again bureaucracy and the um, politicking of saying like who's at fault for for what because sometimes what the data says isn't acceptable politically um i think that we found similar things going on in florida with the COVID cases earlier this year <laughs> um but so yeah wasn't there also somebody higher up in the um, Michigan Health Department that was connected directly, like uh, I believe so. I believe so. It, there was likely somebody. Um, you know, most people who are in power have other friends who are in power. <laughs> right. So that was that was um, pretty crazy. And you know, you think pneumonia, and maybe you don't think it's well. Before this past year, maybe you didn't think it was too bad, but <laughs> but really, you know. For people who are vulnerable, this can be lethal and did kill people. So uh, this outbreak 
in which was hushed away for at least a couple of years and is still being denied. And um, it, it turns out that McLaren Hospital had a history where they they needed to be um, uh, they needed to have cleaned and maintained their water system um, better for many years. They had a kind of a low key outbreak going. It seems, um, you know, it that's it, it's just a a big problem because they were actually um, at fault for killing people, right? Now, it, we we have a, a strange dilemma even with COVID that like, okay, people who are particularly vulnerable, you know, what does it take and how vulnerable are you? Um, we never want anybody to die, obviously, but there, there is something to be said for, okay, well, it, there is a good thing that wasn't killing young, healthy people. Right, and that, that's a good thing that that's uh, you know it seems to be most of the case for COVID as well. Um, yeah, Michigan, you know, Michigan wasn't too bad. Flint was a really difficult, Flint, rough, difficult. rough place, um, but overall, Michigan was a, a great place to be for the most part, except during the winter. <laughs> she she kind of liked it though. Um, okay, so they haven't um, officially kind of been officially connected. They've been accused multiple times. It sounds like. The article that I read, because I looked it up, because he told me he was doing the flex show again. I looked it up, and it, the article that I saw um, said that they had been accused, but they were denying it. So I think it's that the state is saying, "Hey, here's the data. Like we finally come to the states trying again. You know, cover their bum. <laughs> um, multiple people are at fault for multiple things, but um, I think that there were there were lots of things that." McLaren Hospital could have done to um, prevent this from happening, to prevent, at least prevent the second wave from happening because this data up here, it doesn't show the second, um, maybe this is the second wave. I don't know which data that set this is. Yeah, oh, this is the 2015 wave. Yeah, <clears throat> so this is the 2015 wave. So there was stuff that they could have done to prevent this particular wave since they had seen that it had happened in 2014. Um, and they just, I don't know, <laughs> I know they had environmental experts going to the hospital and doing walkthroughs and the data that came out of that was, oh, like, no, it's not hospital A, <laughs> but, um, I don't know. It's kind of, uh, damning evidence. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's all we formally have for you today. Um, thanks for joining. If you've got any more questions, I'm happy to, to stay in the, I can around. Time. I'm on my lunch break. We're good. <laughs> so feel free to ask away. Um, oh, <laughs> yes, I, I, I briefly mentioned it. Okay, so we were, uh, I, I took a couple of public health classes um, while I was a grad student in an environmental engineering program at Georgia Tech. I cross enrolled to Emory um, so that I could uh, find some women, I mean, uh, get the, the health side of you know environmental systems. Um, Rollins School of Public Health at Emory is 80% female, Georgia Tech is 70% male, so yeah. <laughs> we know the real motivations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not entirely wrong. Um, but I, no, I was actually curious. So there's a, a very cool week-long class in January um, on environmental microbiology. And it was basically one week of CDC people coming in and uh, Emory professors giving uh, kind of specialized lectures on food and waterborne disease. Everything I told you about how we determine, you know, how many corona, um, noroviruses does it take to get you sick, and you know those experiments, I learned from that class basically. Um, so I I learned quite a bit, and it was a it was kind of tough sitting there for eight hours a day for a full week, but you know it was it was good, and I had somebody that I, I noticed in class, and I, I even smiled at at her at the water fountain one time, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, but things really got romantic at the end of the week when we um, we had a field trip. And so we went out to a, a drinking water treatment plant and I kind of started chatting a little bit. And then at a wastewater treatment plant, because we went to a, a drinking water plant and then a wastewater plant. The wastewater plant, it was, um, you know, it was a little bit rainy, soggy, and the, the aromas, it just got really romantic there. <laughs> and, uh, um, we kind of hit it off and uh, got to chatting and... Um, who knew, you know, love can blossom in the sewer. <laughs> so yes, a very um, apropos 
and me, considering yes. <laughs> our lines of work. Although I suppose I'm out of that now. You're still. Oh, oh still data. my knowledge and health data, absolutely. Let's go infectious disease. Yes, th thanks for sharing. Yeah. But I think thanks I did... for letting me guess lecture. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. <laughs> it, it is very true. Totally worth it. No problem. All right, I'll just wait a, another moment or two if there's any other last questions. Otherwise, we'll we'll pick up with um, wastewater uh, next Tuesday. I'll tell you a little bit about the carbonating process and kind of how we how we arrange our um, regulatory system to protect our natural waters. Um, what you'll find is a lot of the same processes that we've been learning about. I like to spend a lot of time on drinking water. That's kind of my um, my favorite, but a lot of the same processes apply. All right, so we'll see you then. Um, take care and have a good weekend. Oh, yes. Happy weekend. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye.